no dramas. I'll just, I'll, I'll need to, um, I'll just need to shoot off at about, um, about 10 past two at the latest. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll finish up for them. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Sports medicine people, welcome back to another episode. Now I'm joined by the incredibly knowledgeable Mick Hughes and Kelly's going to be jumping in in a couple of minutes, but I'll quickly run through his resume and let him introduce himself and tell us all about himself. So he's, he's done quite a lot, pretty extensive resume. So worked at Melbourne Sports Medicine, was the head physio and performance manager at Collingwood Magpies netball team. He's actually worked in Newcastle as well, which we we're just talking about off air. And there was a, a couple of points and he'll be able to clarify where he was seeing, you know, between 20 and 30 ACL patients per week, which is just like incredible. So Mick, thank you so much for, for coming on. Oh, welcome, Blake. Uh, thanks for the invite. It's always nice to, yeah, talk shop and uh, hopefully share some up-to-date information about ACL information as it, it's certainly an evolving space. Yeah, every every month there's new papers coming out left, right mm. and centre. So it's, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's an exciting time to be alive, um, especially when it comes to ACL, ACL research. Yeah, you're right with the paper because I like I follow you know your Instagram and your socials and you know you're sharing quite a lot of research and, and breaking it down, which is great. But um, I've got to admit you you do share a lot and like you said, it's always coming out, it's always changing. Um, I remember going to university and being taught you know about knee valgus and this risk factor for ACLs and this one, and then now you know being 2022, we're finding out probably not so much of the risk factor, but yeah, things are always changing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's exhausting trying to keep up, um, but it's 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 good. It, it it makes us all better clinicians, and and definitely, you know, like you go back ten years ago, and how we used to, I guess, get our information is very different to how it is now. Um, definitely with the rise of, of Twitter, especially for me, um, mm. and, and often academics are publishing their research on Twitter, which is definitely a valuable source of information for me. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you know, now TikTok, um, you know, some really <laughs> yeah. good people out there sharing some some good information. There's a lot of misinformation out there, unfortunately, due to mm. the rise of, of the social media channels. But yeah. if you can sift through it and sort of pick you know, the right people to follow, you, you can really stay up to date a little bit easier than, than ever before. You know, 2010, it was typically go to a conference and, and, and get up to date. Um, or go to a weekend PD course and, and get yeah. relatively new information. Um, whereas now it's literally in the palm of your hands if you, if you know how to, who to follow and, yeah. and how to yeah. interpret it. I guess importantly, how to interpret some of that data that's coming your way because it's, it's all well and good to read a paper, but to be able to sort of make sense of it, make it clinically relevant, it's also important. Um, yeah, yeah, and your your social is definitely one to follow. And, and you're right, there's so much bad, bad kind of, re or not bad research, but different people sharing things that probably aren't um, as correct as what we think. And I always think of a red flag when you see the Instagram pile and it says, these are the three things to prevent ACL injuries. Probably yeah, not that's the right. first person yeah. to follow. But, um, yeah, what, the, red, the red flags are, you know, fix this or... Um, yeah, <laughs> or fix, the big cross through the knee or something like that. Prevent this. Yeah. Yeah. More, more often than not, things can't be truly fixed. But yeah, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely a, a, few, a few really good um, yeah, social media kind of... Uh, sharers of information and then mm. there's some there's absolutely some shockers out there so you just need yeah. to find out which ones they are make your own <laughs> make your own minds up yeah now what, one question i did want to ask like because you're like as well as treating acls like obviously being a physio you're treating lots and lots of lower limb upper limb meaning treating everything why why acls what was the, the peak interest in there you just saw them and, and loved the journey or it was just something where you're like i'm, I'm pretty good at this where where did that all start yeah, well, it kind of started in reverse. I, I kind of saw a few in my early careers and was actually, you know, retrospectively quite crap at treating them. Um, and so, um, <laughs> which kind of, I guess, fueled that fire a bit. You know, like as a new grad working here in Townsville in the first couple of years, we, we um, yeah, worked in a pretty busy sports clinic and we, we saw a few ACLs each week. And, and then, you know, having managed a few back then um, and, and knowing and, and experiencing also too firsthand when the person did come in and, and unfortunately have a second ACL injury and mm. kind of, you know, had a couple of those in my first few years. And then also again in Newcastle when we moved down there once again um, yep. as an early, early career physio. And, and to be fair, I guess I'm on myself. There, there's certainly the research in terms of return to sport play and like a return to sport assessments and discharge criteria weren't mm. set, set very well back then. Yeah. 
Um, this is all pre-2016 pre when the evidence really just started to come through with um, criteria-driven rehab and certainly criteria-driven return to sport mm -hmm. um, rather than timeline-based um, mm -hmm. rehab. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that kind of, I guess, sort of really, you know, that personal reflection along the way really sort of made me want to get better. Um, and then conversely, when I moved to Melbourne and got the gig with Collingwood, you know, working in netball was very much so a, a, a knee-dominant um, sport for injuries. Um, ankles and knees take up a lion's share of what you'll see you know, as, a, as a treating physio in netball. Um, ankles actually, interestingly, will, will take up a lot more injury burden, but the ACLs are also a real risk. And yeah. obviously with an ACL injury, it's going to have the longest length of time out um, yeah. with each athlete. And the, the interesting thing with netball, particularly at that elite level, is that you, you've got 10 contracted players um, and seven of which will be on the court, three will be on the bench. Um, and then you'll have a small list of training partners, so about five, you know, reserves mm -hmm. essentially who will play the lower tier competition. It's a very thin line that you can tread um, in terms of prevention and performance. Um, you know, NRL levels, you'll have 17 that suit up on NRL. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have 13, you know, who will play reserve grade. So you've got a little bit of margin for error. Yeah. AFL mm -hmm. list will have 40 players that are on their list, um, you know, and 17 will rock up and play. And so you've got a, a bit more margin for error there. Netball, you, you literally had zero margin for error there. Um, and so that that from an injury prevention point of view and from a rehabilitation point of view, I, I really wanted to learn as much as I could um, and better myself <laughs> in that space. And that's kind of where it started. Yeah. Because um, we did have an ACL that we were rehabbing um, to begin with when, when the season started. We, you know, she was a new player to our team and we picked up her rehab. And then she unfortunately had a second injury on a contralateral side um, late in the season. But we also had another couple of knee athletes that we were managing too. So we just we just really needed to get that rehab right. And, and mm -hmm. certainly that's where it all started. And, and on the back of that, you know, getting some invitations to speak at conferences and, and present that data and, and that case yeah. and um, present at workshops. And yeah, and obviously seeing a few people in the clinic, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, with a busy ACL list, you tend to sort of, get quite good at, at what you see all the time. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously if, if they're coming through to you in the clinic, you got to really make sure you're providing that high level right. service, yeah. um, which really forces you to, to, <laughs> yeah, read, no <laughs> to read and stay up to date. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that, that's kind of like how it all started. Like yeah, other people uh, speaking to Randall Cooper, my, my good mate, who's definitely a, an, an ACL research or ACL um, guru is um, he, he, he had a previous ACL reconstruction and he talked to, you know, Brooke, Brooke Patterson is also, you know, deep in ACL research. Mm -hmm. You know, they've all experienced past ACL injuries themselves that fueled their fire. I, yeah. I, I haven't injured my ACL. I, I just kind of, I guess, um, thrust myself into it in, in, in fear of doing a bad job. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> oh, well, so, If you, if yeah, you want to be so a nurse, you've got to do your own ACL so you really know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I did, I've done my PCL. Well, that's kind of that'll do. Um, I don't really yeah. like doing an ACL, so we'll... yeah. And this, uh, this is Kelly, by the way. Kelly's coming in five minutes late, but that's okay. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Yeah, welcome to the party. Yeah. So, well, um, and talking about like like women and, and netball and things like that. What, like, why, why are women more common to have ACL injuries? Is is there research on this, or is it anecdotal stuff, or, or what's your your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, this is really. I guess fascinating topic, um, and and very much so uh, an important to topic. I guess to to probably get our heads around because I mean traditionally we we have known for quite some time, you know, that females certainly carry a higher risk of of the, an ACL injury occurring, and then also to second ACL injuries occurring as well. Um, there's been you know a lot of I guess research done to try and understand um, what are the modifiable risk factors and also understand what are the non-modifiable risk factors and, and mm -hmm. we've, we've got some data out there that tries to explain these higher levels of, of injuries and why they're occurring um, you know based on anatomy um, mm -hmm. hormonal differences um, family history um, past history of ACL injuries um, yes yeah, yeah I think we've sort of tacked off structural as well mm -hmm. um, and, and anatomy but the, the, there's Certainly, 
it's probably been something that's been escaping all the research. And, and I read this really fascinating paper and this really important take on it from um, Joanne Parsons, Stephanie Cohen, and Sheree Becker, who written this really nice paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. It's a free, free text article if anyone's interested. And it's it's definitely really highlighting the 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 gender um, differences between males and females um, and, and how females unfortunately are probably a little bit biased in, in a lot of their um, I guess injury prevention programs and strength and conditioning programs and, and the sports they play as well very being non-contact you know, mm. sports, of course, males play non-contact sports too, but not to the same degree as females. And we know the non-contact mechanism of injury is going to be a far more common way to injure the ACL than a contact injury. So, um, you know, sports like netball, touch football, mm. Oztag, you know, soccer, mm. where there's going to be a little bit more of a gender bias towards females playing those sports than males, um, that absolutely will, will, will play a role in the numbers that we're yeah. seeing. Um, so we can't always blame it on anatomy. We can't, you know, the, the you know, wider hips, the Q angles, the, mm. the valguses that we see, all these kind of things. We can't all, and, and the research really still can't explain why these mm. things are happening. But I think we do need to take a deeper look at it. And that's what this paper really sort of opened my eyes to that understanding is we can't just always just say, oh, throw our hands up in the air and say, oh, stuff it, you know, like we're just going to have to deal and deal with this acceptance of females are going to have a minimum three times greater risk of a, an ACL injury from occurring in the sports they play. Like we, we can we can and should do better than that. And, and supporting females in their training environments and sporting environments will absolutely go a long way to achieving that rather than just sort of pumping a whole lot of money into trying to figure out is there biomechanical reasons or is there hormonal reasons or just putting on the contraceptive pill and hoping for the best mm. and saying, you know, don't play because you're at this high risk period of your of your hormonal cycle. Like we just can't do that kind can't of do, stuff, yeah. and it's not. Yeah, yeah. So that, that that's where unfortunately there's probably a, a, a massive. It's a massive um, multifactorial reason, but mm. there's going to be a lot of that kind of gendered bias, I guess, towards probably why females are a bit more susceptible, and what we're seeing in the numbers anyway. Um, you know, like in these early stages of the AFL women's competition, we saw numbers compared to the men's competition, um, nearly 10 times greater risk of an ACL injury at the AFL women's level yeah. at the, you know, at that professional standard. Um, and sorry, I was saying quoted because it wasn't yeah. professional, so it wasn't professionally supported. Yeah. It was, they were, you know, they were still technically amateur. They were getting paid to play, but they still had to work. Mm. Um, and certainly from a um, support system, you know, these, these female athletes weren't getting the same essence support they weren't getting the same training environment support as the males um, and all these other things that were ultimately playing a, a huge role in their injury uh, rates as well um, I think over time that will certainly come down um, from that 10 times greater risk mm. compared to the men um, and they're now I think seven seven years in or you know six or seven seasons into that competition I think it's coming down a bit yeah but um, yeah a few years ago it was astronomically high um, but largely due to probably the poor support systems in place mm. um yeah so that's hopefully that answers a bit of the question yeah uh, i think can you hear kelly because i can't definitely can't hear her <laughs> no no i think she's out but i'll i'll, I'll take the next question because i know that she'll want to talk about that why she fixes that up but talking about like the non-operative versus the operative which is the other big kind of social media question and, and i was actually talking to a couple of, of good mates of mine yesterday they've both had um one went non-operative no sorry one went operatively and had the cadaver um reconstruction and one had some of the hamstring and the first guy with the cadaver, he's redone his. And then my other mate who's had the hamstring, he's just had so many problems, not so much with his knee, but with his hamstring. So not as, as successful. What, what do you think, depending on, is it a, a question of instability versus operative versus non-operative? Or, you know, are you bracing at 90 degrees of flexion and then non-weight-bearing weight for six weeks and then going from there? Or, or what's your kind of opinion on, on non-operative versus operative? Yeah, yeah, it's... um massively hot topic um mm -hmm. i think ultimately like if we sort of break it down because there's there's definitely the that last bit you mentioned with the the bracing protocol um it's it's something that's emerging and we're, we're, i think that paper um is due for publication later on this year um we, 
which will sort of give us some really good ideas as to who these um, people are, because it's absolutely, it's a sub, it's a sub group of ACL injured patients. So from what I've seen and heard, it's, it's the proximal attachment tears that are best suited for this trial of bracing. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be implemented from within a week post injury to get the, the best chance of any kind of uniting of that femoral attachment of the ACL back to the, the you know, the femoral footprint. Um, that's kind of like if, if you get capture them in the right time and it's the right person and the emerging evidence and, and one also to being compliant to the bracing protocol for mm. six weeks is a pretty tough challenge. Um, so, you know, like if you can convince them to do that and obviously they're, they're that you know, good candidate, then absolutely that, that would be, you know, and, and the, the success rates from what I'm hearing are really good. I think um, in the ballpark of at least 80 or 90% success yeah, rate. That's good. Um, with the right person, with the right management and the right compliance. How, um, how tricky so, is it to restore extension at, at the end of a bracing protocol? Yeah, that's, it, it's hard. Um, it'll absolutely um, be a, a challenge. And, you know, six weeks of immobilisation, you're going to get a hamstring contracture. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a known side effect. It, it can restore and will restore because it's not just, you know, out of the brace at six weeks and off you go good luck it's restoring that extension by 10 degrees every week till you get back to about zero and then at 12 weeks you're out of the brace so you're still in the brace to 12 weeks but you're slowly restoring yourself back gradually to to full knee extension mm -hmm. um and it'll eventually get there and even if you maybe at 12 weeks for argument's sake have lost maybe five degrees extension it, it won't take long to get back once you get back into some really good rehab practices and mm -hmm. but yeah that, that, that will absolutely happen. Um, so that's kind of like, I guess, yeah, capturing the, the right person with, the, with that, pro, um, that protocol. Mm -hmm. But inevitably, we, we are going to come across people who have the mid-substance tears or have delays in presenting and, and don't get braced. And then, yeah. and then they're kind of like in the hands of the gods, you know, like because we know even still that people can, without the bracing people can heal that numbers probably drops down to potentially 25 i don't know 20 to 25 percent we don't have any hard data mm -hmm. on this um the canon trial from a few years ago did find that and they didn't brace any of their post injured acls so the canon trial if you're not familiar with it they basically divided two groups of acl injured patients into an early reconstruction and then the delayed reconstruction with what we found at the end of the two year period is that the delayed reconstruction group, we had about 40% of people electing for a reconstruction, which ultimately left 60% of people still rehabbing. Mm. What the authors did a few years later when they had a bit of time, they actually went back through the MRIs of that, that rehab alone group. So that's 60% of people who were still rehabbing, uh, sorry, that whole entire group. Mm. They looked at their MRIs again they actually found that 56% of those people who were rehabbing still, so half of that group were, were healed mm -hmm. uh, on an MRI. So, Incredible. yeah, and they weren't braced at all. So th there certainly is a degree of healing that can occur without the need for restrictive bracing. But I guess mm -hmm. if you kind of have the sort of the, the balls in there saying, all right, if you brace, you brace your knee and you're the right candidate and we put you in a brace for you know six weeks and then stretch you out over the 12 week mark and you, you've got an 80 to 90 percent chance of healing you, you'd go down that pathway or you know if you say oh look don't worry about bracing you're, you've got a good chance of healing anyway yet that chance maybe drops down to 20 percent oh. mm. i know which one i'd be taking yeah. <laughs> um, yeah as 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 restrictive and tough that bracing protocol would be i think in the right person who's willing to go through that pain and annoyance for six weeks and the outcome is likely to be really good and, and mm. you get good healing pain, mm. I, I'd, I'd probably do, do it think, myself. If I was to injure my ACL, I'll do it. Do you that. think it would accelerate the return to sport process as well? Or is that still going to be just no. the same? Yeah, okay. No, I, I, yeah, I think ultimately the the graph, the healing ACL still got a lot of maturity to mm. go. Um, yeah, it, it, you'd still be a bit cautious with return to sport. I think with... And, 
in twisting sports as well. And you'd certainly get the person to prove prove their 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 worth ultimately and get them to pass, you know, the, the same tests mm. that you would do for an, an ACL reconstruction and still set the same benchmarks. Mm. But that that healing ligament has still got a bit of maturation to achieve. Um, we probably don't have any data yet to, you know, this is probably the first of many papers yet to come and, and they'll probably hopefully look at, you know, how strong is this ligament at the end of 12 months um, when they follow up, you know, it doesn't look like a nice thick black line on, a, on an MRI as what it would do on a, on a normal person. Because mm-hmm. we know with the, with the ACL reconstructions, we're not seeing full graft maturity to at least 18 months to two years. Um, in, in, in some, some types of graphs. So, yeah, I think it's pretty unfair to expect to go through that healing protocol, that brace protocol, protocol and expect to get back to sport at four, four months post-injury because it's going to take probably the best part of three months minimum to restore your strength and power and function mm. and range of movement back to pre-injury levels. Mm. And so we're kind of still looking at a minimum six-month return to sport um, and, but probably realistically closer to eight or nine months return to sport with the, with the bracing protocol. Yeah. Um, but, and, and some people would say that and go, well, I'll just have a reconstruction because it's going to have the same amount of time. But you're, you're avoiding, by doing that, you're avoiding a whole lot of surgical intervention. Mm. You know, the, the surgical scars, the harvest tissue pain, like what you said, mentioned before, Blake, with your mate who's pinged his mm. hamstring a few times. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you're not getting that irritation and soft tissue, I guess, pain that happens when you use, you know, harvest tissue from elsewhere. Um, you're avoiding a second trauma to the knee. You know, the, mm. the surgery has to sort of drill through bone and, and, and cartilage to produce those tunnels where the new ACL will go. Um, you get a second dose of pain and swelling, which ultimately can knock around your quads a lot. So, yeah. Yes, the, the return to sports are probably in the same ballpark, but the and the financial cost as well, obviously, um, yeah. and anesthetics and, and all those kind of things that, that carry a degree of risk. Mm. You, you, you absolutely are coming out far ahead in the what long do run. You, what, what do you think? Um, and I obviously don't work with many surgeons, and I'm not referring people for ACL as being a podiatrist, but what do you think, you know, that and it's probably different from the the surgeons that you work with, but but the surgeons, you know, generally seeing that it's probably not as successful as what it was, or is it, pardon me, still the case where most people that present, they're like, yep, you need surgery, and they're not really following it on a non-operative way? Yeah, uh, in, in terms of the healing? like the- Yeah, like they're more opting towards surgery because it was previously thought that surgery was better. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I think, you know, surgeons got their bias um you know physios we've got our bias you know probably a bit more mm. towards rehab um yeah it's certainly a, a changing a changing space here and 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 trying to get um you know like and, and this probably uh, i was getting to with the with the talk about the non-operative because there'll be people who don't heal right so mm. you know like you got these people who do you know either go through cross bracing protocol and got a high chance of healing you got the other people who just miss the boat and and, and may heal but then you've got a whole lot of people who into their acl and and will always remain acl deficient mm. um so those people then have an interesting crossroads because we do have some literature out there to say look you you can if you rehab really really well and we're talking a good three months of rehab um you can try and if that three months is successful then you, you can you know and if you are accepting of the risks of, of further knee injury, which, which the risks are really real. And then I was talking to a guy earlier on today that, you know, went down the rehab pathway of rehab alone without the reconstruction, went back to Oztag and had an instability episode within a few games and, and injured his meniscus um, to the point where it was irreparable. And so he had to then have a partial meniscectomy, um, largely due to the instability and the lack of ACL. Um, that is a known risk factor. We don't we know that actually probably is more likely to happen without a surgical graft there, but mm-hmm. there are cases where people actually do go back to sport and, and perfect, uh, perfectly fine. fine and function perfectly fine. And then conversely, we know that ACL reconstruction isn't perfect. As you mentioned, your mate has had a graft failure. Mm-hmm. Um, we know that second ACL injuries and not on, not only just the reconstructed side, but the other side, they're really common within the first two years after reconstruction. Um, 
um, in the under 20 year old age group, we're talking about one in three and sometimes one in four will re-injure their, will have a second ACL injury within two years um, after their first ACL injury. Um, and much more common to happen on their contralateral side. So their other side, not their graft side. Mm. Um, that, that happens, that those risks are real, um, which often isn't discussed. Mm. And we, we also know that the meniscus injuries can occur despite having a, a, an ACL intact or a reconstructed ACL. Once again, I've just have been consulting with a guy this week who's seven months post-op who had an instability episode in his rehab, his ACL graft is fine, but he tore his meniscus. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, you can have a, a, a stable knee and an ACL intact knee, but yet still have meniscus Problem. injuries. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's just that they're more likely to happen without an ACL intact, especially with yeah. pivoting, twisting sports. Yeah. So, my, Sorry, uh, yeah. so, oh, so, so my conversation with someone who is not healed and wants to go back to sport but my conversation revolves around okay well are you willing to change your sports and go away from pivoting twisting sports and if the answer is no and they're young and like under the age of 25 is you know typically young and you know probably maybe stretch it out to 30 um if they're under the age of 30 and they want to go back to pivoting twisting sports my, my kind of recommendation is to have reconstruction um, because of the risks uh, are, are going to be dampened down and, and they're going to have a probably a much more fluid pathway to return back to sport um, if they're unwilling yeah so if they are willing to change and just you know maybe go back to play tennis or go to the gym do crossfit or you know just be fit and active in general life and and, and avoid those pivoting twisting sports um, then i'm all I'm all in saying let's go rehab let's do rehab alone for as long as you like and let's let's just keep on going and see if yeah, you can avoid right. um, that surgery but it's the return to pivoting twisting sports particularly with those young athletes like the the 18 to 25 year olds or well, 16 to 25 year olds because they're happening in much younger ages than ever before um I, I yeah I, my default certainly is a, a recommendation of a reconstruction okay. just for that reason that if you injure the meniscus and it is an irreparable meniscus tear that person is going to have arthritic change within 10 years um, yeah it's almost yeah. guaranteed and you're going to have old young people with old knees and we're yeah. seeing it now we're seeing you know 15 16 year old kids at the age of 30 that have got you know moderate to severe oa change already um oh. because of what's uh, what's played out so mm -hmm. yeah it's um they, they, yeah really 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 tricky um but, but really tricky case to have but it's important that once again physios and um because often it, it is it's the physios that are going to be central to a lot of this conversation but it's having this discussion alongside the gp or the sports doc and the orthopedic surgeon the patient and and, and the physio or, or and exercise professionals and podiatrists and mm. trying to get everyone to get on the same page for this one rather than mm. You as a clinician hold on to them and, and keep them hidden from the surgeon and conversely the surgeon you know but and open to you know rehab first um which is rare yeah yeah that's very interesting hey um so sorry what i was trying to say before when i didn't realize my microphone wasn't working so apologies for that but oh, like the acls are so heavily studied and it is such a hot topic so with with everything that we know around acls and as common as they are like are, are the rates of them decreasing as we learn more or are they increasing or just staying the same um they're actually increasing as it as it is um so there was a paper published earlier on this year that looked at hospital hospital data from the last 10 years but then also to projected for the next 10 years ahead um, and and we we've seen a really strong uptick and we're projecting to see a strong up in ACL injuries that present to hospitals um, by 2032 we're going to see you know a, you know a significant amount of ACL injuries particularly in the young female in that 10 to 15 year age age group they're the demographic right now as it stands that that is on a, a massive uptick and we've seen you know a significant amount of ACL injuries occurring in that group more than any other age group and and 
male and female demographic, um, and it's going to continue to climb. And, and it also do in males as well. But of all the knee injuries that can be sustained, ACL injuries in both males and females, and especially young females, it, it's, on a, it's on a really scary ride upwards um, over these next 10 years. Um, and that's just accounting for the public hospital data. That doesn't include private practice presentations. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's it's a concern, um, and and that's just not here in Australia. We've seen data from America where it's um, and the UK and New Zealand where mm. the rates over the last twenty years. Um, to be fair, the rates that they're talking about are the reconstruction rates not injury rates, um, mm. but it's fair to say if reconstruction rates are going up and, and, yeah, and given yeah. that in, in yeah. those countries that ACL reconstruction often is the default treatment choice, mm. um, we're talking, you know, 90% reconstruction rates. So if someone injured, you know, nine people, you know, 10 people that injured their ACL, nine of them would, would be offered a reconstruction. Yeah. So if the reconstruction rates are going up, then it's fair to say the amount of injuries are also going up as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's all it's happening all across the world, not not just here in Australia. But we we certainly find ourselves in a unique sporting environment here in Australia that we we play codes that are very unique to Australia, more so than other parts of the world. Like you know, netball is played in other Commonwealth countries, but it, it's not seen in in America. Um, and, and definitely AFL rules, you know, yeah. Aussie rules. It it's a hundred percent, you know, played here. You might you might find some small pockets of social AFL in, in the UK or over in America, but it's a it's a big, you know, big sport all, all across yeah. here. And it's a unique sport that's it's a 360 degree sport, lots of bumps, lots of jumps and lands and pivots, twists and turns, and both males and females are taking it up in in big numbers. Um yeah, and certainly netball is probably a little bit more unique and a bit more common, and, and yeah. they're highly played here in young females uh, more than anywhere else across across the globe, across the world. So why why do we think the rates are increasing so drastically? Is it just the um, like people that are playing sport, or the level of competition is getting um, more aggressive, or or the higher? Yeah, um, or what do we think? Yeah, there's it's yeah. I mean, we sort of mentioned a little bit about probably the lack of you know support. Mm. Um, from certainly at a, at a female level that we talked about before, but there's definitely some schools of thought as to why it's happening, you know, in both males and females. Um, one, one line of thinking is, is that we're, we've, we've currently got like a, a population of young, young adults that are bigger and heavier than ever before. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, going back a generation, like our, our younger kids are taller and a little bit heavier than, you know, say 20, 30 years ago. They're also a little bit more sedentary um, mm. than, than previous generations as well, um, largely due to technology um, and, and that kind of stuff. So, but kids being kids, they're still active. Um, you know, like they, they might be taller and heavier, but they still like to go out and do fun stuff and, you know, play sports. Yet they're probably doing it on a bit more of a sedentary base. Um, so that's one kind of line of thinking. Um, the second is, is that where we may be seeing it a little bit more in our specialisation program. So these elite sporting academies that have popped up a little bit more commonly over the last, you know, five or 10 years um, where the kids just play soccer all year round or they only play netball or they only play, you know, one particular sport and they're getting, they're getting those repetitive sort of injuries. That, that's the other kind of school of thought there as to why that might be happening. Um, yeah. I, I've certainly seen and this is probably you know it would be interesting to see what the data presents like over the next couple of years but definitely COVID related and lack of training exposure regular training exposure and match exposure I've seen a, a fairly decent trend in, in ACL injuries um, within a couple of months after returning back to sport after the COVID layoffs um, with some of my recreational and amateur um, ACLs that I've seen um, and, and certainly have Happening a lot more in the older, you know, it used to be a, a young person's injury. I'm seeing more and more, you know, 30, 40 year olds that are injuring their ACL playing social sports after having a, having a break for a couple of years due to COVID or, um, you know, mums that are, you know, have got old enough kids now. They've had kids, you know, had maybe two or three kids and have had a bit of time off social sports and they're both, the kids are getting older. They feel like they're back, you know, able to sort of go back to social sports and within a 
a few games, their ACL's gone. Um, yeah, that, that's that's certainly that's certainly what we're seeing anecdotally, but also too from um, yeah some some lines of thinking about why we're seeing that up uptick in uh, in injuries. Yeah, it's funny mm-hmm. you mentioned um, like with having a couple of kids and going back to sport. I all of that just in my mind. I don't know why the mayor of Newcastle went back to playing netball and then like a couple of weeks later posted that she had done her ATL, which is crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, it's uh, all too common theme, unfortunately. It certainly seems as though the early sports specialisation across the board is definitely not a good idea. Like I can't really see much that um, supports that anywhere in any injury. No, no, there's probably some um, maybe outdated beliefs that, you know, you you have to play the one thing over and over and over again to get good at it. Um, Yeah, the the likes of, you know, Tiger Woods um, often is, is a you know, use as an, as an example as to what, you know, someone, if someone plays the same sport over and over and over again, obviously a lot of tennis athletes too often. Um, uh, but in, conversely, both, you know, like I think Andre Agassi gets often tossed up at the same same conversation, but both those people have had, you know, significant, you know, issues throughout their life outside of, um, you know, their sports. But, you know, you also look at some of the more elite sports, sports stars too, like Le- LeBron James is of this world. Mm-hmm. and some other athletes they they are big advocates for playing multiple sports in, in their mm. junior careers and having that chain having those different movement pathways and those different exposures to different movement patterns and and to take physical breaks away from the, the regular mm. grind of that one sport is, is really positive um yeah. prevents a lot of mental burnout um you yeah, know prevents a lot of different movement qualities as well that can be quite protective to the acl mm. um yeah so there's a lot of lot of benefit to playing multiple sports as a teenager there comes a time where you need to choose I think if you if you probably usually by the time they're 16 17 they played multiple sports through their early teens they probably just need to come to a point where they need to choose um but yeah like these specialized programs I'm, I'm a massive fan for giving kids a break throughout the year and choosing different fun things to play just to break up and prevent some of that burnout totally totally now we, we spoke about meniscus injuries a, a little bit but I'm keen to pick your brains a little bit more on meniscus mm. injuries when when the ACL is involved and, and maybe when it's not as well. But it certainly seems as though when there's been an ACL injury and the, the meniscus is involved, there, there's certainly more of a tendency to go towards um, down that surgical route. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. In the uh, acutely injured meniscus in the young athlete, um, Often, yeah, the treatment choices are um, a meniscus repair. And, and I honestly think that's justified um, mm-hmm. in, like, you know, an 18, 20-year-old athlete that's got a meniscus tear that's, you know, causing knee locking um, or is giving symptoms and, and is repairable. If we get them early enough and the surgeon can repair it, mm-hmm. that, that, is, that is a massive win for that person and their knee. If... If we if we kind of like dismiss it and uh, you know I guess ignore it and that person continues to have locking episodes or insta you know just yeah locking insta episodes or um, you know ir- irritated knee joint from the repeated synovitis is from that annoying you know meniscus load um, and then it becomes irreparable and the, they come to the point where the surgeon you know, one day you know chops that little bit out that that's ultimately going to lead to some extra loading and stress that goes across the knee joint mm-hmm. leading that knee, knee joint to to change over time um so definitely in the young young person with a meniscus injury there, there certainly is a, a, a good argument to say yeah it's probably a good idea to repair that torn meniscus um in the certainly the older athlete that's um, developing meniscus symptoms whilst they play sport, and it's likely to be more degenerative in nature. There's a really obviously the conversely the strong argument there is is to rehabilitate and, and, and yeah. really yeah get this person you know get their quadriceps strong. Um, you know obviously look after the other proximal chain and, and distal distal chain muscles in the, in the calf and certainly get the hemis and glutes involved, but you know, and get the uh, get the person a bit stronger and, and generally fitter, and, and definitely get the quads nice and strong. Um, really strong argument to go through a good twelve week program of strength. Oh, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, just did sorry, I think the internet <laughs> cut out a little bit there. Um, <laughs> sorry, you were saying 12, yeah, 12 week program of just quads, hemis, like proximal more distal stuff. Does it, does yeah. it have to be specific? How, how uh, I know you you've put up some good stuff on your um on your social media and I, I love this one. It was just like picking a couple of groups of different exercises and then you can just kind of plug and play it and put them yeah. all together. Like how specific does it have to be for this kind of rehab? <clears throat> no, yeah, it's a great question because I think, you know, like to be honest, no, I don't think it needs to be specific. You know, like we, there are some great programs out there and obviously the GLAD program is fantastic. It's structured, it's well thought out, it's organised, it's very, it's packaged up really, really nicely. I'm a huge fan of that. And it's obviously got a little bit more to it um, in terms of, you know, regular outcome measures and it's, you know, very formal, very structured, um it, it's very very it's, it's also got the new you know, good sort of balance and neuromuscular training but in the event that you work in a practice that doesn't have glad or you know you work in a practice you know out out in the sticks and you know you don't have a great gym you know pro, you know access and, and all that kind of stuff like ultimately variety is going to be king here and and to keep the person engaged throughout a good 12-week program minimum is it's kind of trumps all that um, you know, as long as you, you know, specifically target the quadricep muscle in both open chain and closed chain ways, because you know that open chain doesn't allow the, the person to cheat um, and find a stronger hip muscle to perform that squat or the lunge or the, the leg press or whatever it may be, which is pretty classic yeah. behaviour for someone that's got a persistent knee problem. They'll, they'll have a weak quad that will force the the knee into shifting the load elsewhere to try and perform that task so making sure you're looking by it both at open chain and, and closed chain quad biased work introducing any kind of you know hamstring focus work be it deadlifts or hammy curls making sure you've got some calf work there making sure you also to look at you know some cardiovascular options you know low impact cardiovascular options bike work cross trainer mm -hmm. whatever they love to do get them engaged in it it's it's less honestly it's less about the exercise more often than not than just getting them to do it regularly yeah <laughs> it, it yeah. certainly trump, trumps that and if we can keep that going you know if we can get them engaged into at least two to three strength sessions per week you know four to five you know cardiovascular sessions per week um basically meeting the world health organization guidelines for physical activity for adults um, that's going to be ticking a lot of boxes. And if we can to sustain that for a minimum 12 weeks and keep that going forever, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be a huge win. Um, yeah. and, and obviously, you know, the challenge is to try and keep them going beyond that 12 week intervention. Most people get to the end of the 12 weeks and feel better and then they stop. And then mm -hmm. within a few months, their symptoms creep back in again. Mm -hmm. Um, so the challenge is to try and think about their knee differently. And that's what I often say, you know, get to this 12 week period. Um, think, think about what you're doing for your knee, really prioritize and say, okay, I'm getting up out of bed today. I'm doing my rehab for my knee so I can get better. Then at the end of that 12 weeks and, you know, if they obviously have scored better and their outcome measures are better and things looking obviously better, um, I get them to try and think about things differently in that this now program is for you this is about yeah. you trying to get better globally so it's about you trying to sort of reduce your risk of cardiovascular diseases type 2 diabetes um all these you know preventable cancers that that yeah. can occur when we don't exercise and move um mm -hmm. obviously reduce the risk of your oa flare-ups all this kind of stuff so it's trying to get them to think about the bigger picture and trying to sustain that program almost in yeah. and trying to get them to do it forever um yeah yeah that's kind of yeah how i'd go about it what are what would be the most common mistakes that you see clinicians making when managing acl injuries or meniscus and let's go the acute ones rather than the degenerative type but in these acute injuries what what are the common mistakes you see clinicians making that are yeah avoided? So, so for the acl it's it's often an acl reconstruction um it, it's the absence of knee extension by far and away is, is the biggest mistake I, I see, um, largely due to you know, often the post-op protocol from the surgeon who has probably reproduced the same post-op protocol to, for the last 20 years and just dished out the same piece of paper every time. Um, but the, that research has certainly 
um, changing and evolving. And, and we now know, certainly from a safety point of view and, and a, a lack need, you know, a ACL laxity point of view that open chain exercises when done thoughtfully um, throughout those first 12 weeks can positively impact the person's walking, um, confidence, strength in other areas that can positively influence that much, much uh, better than, than not doing them. And certainly not doing them will often feed that cycle of the muscle is already affected by pain and swelling and inhibition post-operatively and post-injury too, for that matter. Um, so that weakness can really set in and that muscle inhibition can set in. And if we allow it to set in, then that just reinforces that cheating mechanism where they'll go searching for the stronger hip muscle to perform that task. Mm. So that, that's the biggest error that I see. Secondly, the other one that I'll see for both um, you know, ACL reconstruction and, and meniscus um, injuries is that underloading. Um, you know, being too, very, being too cautious, so I think for too long, um, Fair enough, like, you know, 12 weeks post ACL reconstruction, 12 weeks post injury after a meniscus injury, um, we do need to go a bit lighter and easier with our loading. We might need to sort of really take some, you know, three sets of 15 kind of numbers, you know, two to three times a week just to sort of get that knee joint a bit more happier. But after, after that period, generally the person's built up enough strength and, and capacity to move into, you know, your three by uh, you know, three sets or four sets is of eight to tens and push the envelope a little bit harder. And then once again, once you've acclimatised to that, that change to developing a bit more power needs to be introduced. And once again, we, we often can strengthen people up really well, but we often forget about the power, especially those that want to go back to sport. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be just a, a, an issue with the person's, the physio's ego, not allowing themselves to let go of their patient um, <laughs> or just not understanding that their skill set sort of ends now and, and doesn't allow them to say, okay, I, I don't know how to prescribe the jumping, the landing, the power work or the on-field stuff. And that's where as, as a group, as a physio profession, we need to be really understanding of where our limits are in our mm -hmm. exercise prescription. If we can't take someone beyond the gym and into power development and speed and jumping and landing and pivoting and, and that kind of on-field stuff, then we need to pass them on. Mm -hmm respectfully to, to someone else and work together um, you know, work together with the SNC coaches and, and other pe other people involved in, in that back end rehab if you, if you don't know how to do that but yeah that, that'll probably be the big two the two big ones is um, yeah yeah I often think that like I'm very lucky to have a gym where I work and we see a lot of ACL rehab at, at my practice but I often think how how some clinicians do a good job of that without access to to those sorts of things and I think it, it does it's such a disservice to to the patient not being able to access that or trying to hold on to them without setting them up with the appropriate person that can do that so yeah that's but, right. yeah. yeah is there any any like who, where would you recommend to go to learn you know that that kind of skill set like any courses or, or anything like that that you can recommend you know for students um, and newer graduates with me yeah for like new grads that that have just sort of come out of high school and straight into physiotherapy, um, they they generally you know probably tick off um, a little bit of exercise programming. You know, there's only so much you can learn and 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 be you know and teach from a from a physio you know a, like a tutoring and an academic perspective. There's only so much you can fit into the curriculum. So I'm, I'm never never critical of what the universities provide, but yeah. they post graduate definitely there's um, a lot of courses like the APA. They put on a really nice level one strength and conditioning um, workshop um, that is really good, you know, from an entry level point of view that, you know, you can go and do that. I think it might be one or two day workshop and that can be built on with a level two um, as far as I know. And then obviously the Australian Strength and Conditioning Association have got great, you know, level one, level two, level three, S&C coach uh, pathways. And I, I think I think that should be the... Um, I Thing that they should be really looked at if you if you want to get a career in just in sports physio sports podiatry um mm -hmm. you know evolve your practice from an ep into being an snc coach um that would be the things that i'd 
I would conduct myself. Uh, I'd sort of go off and do that and try and grow in, in that area to really fine tune your ability to rehab through the mm. mid to late stages. I think as, as new grads in, you know, all our, all our career paths, we're really good at treating pain um, and trying to improve function in those first, you know, six to 12 weeks post presentation where we probably struggle a little bit is through that kind of yeah mid to late stages where the person's getting a little bit excited about returning back to running, jumping, mm. training, and then subsequently sport. And that's where a lot of their rehab really needs to be tailored quite quite um, nicely mm. to keep up with the demands of those sport activities. So so yeah, that would, that would certainly be something I'd, I'd as a new grad uh, or, or a student be looking at already. Yeah, great. That's awesome. I I got a lot out of that. So thank you I so guess, much. For yeah, I did want to have one more question. And what is and I so I've done what did I do to mine? Can I kind of remember ACL and then bucket handle on my medial meniscus when I was like twenty two playing footy. Yeah. And there was this weird thing where and everybody seemed to have or I definitely got told not to do leg extensions in the gym. What what where has that come from? And I know that's not true now. Yeah. Is it just yeah. is it some old thing we used to believe or what was it going Yeah, with that? yeah. There were some papers from the early nineties, so the early to mid nineties that that showed that there was um some strain behaviors through the ACL that I think were, yeah, probably were, people were a bit worried about. Yeah. And, and certainly some of the messages that came from those papers were like, yeah, that we probably should avoid those open chain exercises. They tend to uh, increase the laxity of the graft, but mm-hmm. we certainly have fine tuned some of it. I mean, to be honest, like the papers have been pretty thin on the ground and the randomized control trials have been pretty thin on the ground since then. There's, probably a couple from memory through the mid 2000s. I know of a couple that have just been published um, by a a French research group um, that have shown really positive outcomes with full range open chain exercises in high volumes (laughs) with the appropriate load is Mm. really key. You know, like finding weight and load that you can perform, you know, uh, 60% one RM. You know, yeah. and we're doing three yeah. sessions a week and we're not, you know, really trying to smash out the loads and, and we'd be really, here, you know, be, be heroes too, too hard, too soon, too early. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and they've had no ill effect on the graph laxity. So, um, yeah. yeah, look, I, I think uh, what you were advised is, is a hangover from the, the 90s and the 2000s um, and certainly, you know, some of the, the surgeons' beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, we, we, we're starting to really be, well, I, yeah, there's a lot more research coming out in the next year or two um, that will mm-hmm. hopefully get people thinking differently about it, mm-hmm. yeah. um, particularly orthopedic surgeons. Um, mm-hmm. But also, yeah, us as clinicians too, getting, getting comfortable with prescribing them because the, I've seen so many people benefit by, by introducing them. Um, and doing it safely and gently to begin with and then gradually building up over time is a really good way to go about it. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get there one day. (laughs) We'll get there. (laughs) Awesome, mate. Thank you so much for for coming on. Much appreciated again so much. Yeah, it was great. Really, really enjoyed it. I know it's hard and I like working at the university. It's very hard for me to give advice to students because they always ask about ACL and I just don't see them. So it's great to be able to create this resource to them. And I just direct them to your pages anyway, but it's great yeah. to be able to create a resource for them to listen to and, and get a bit of an understanding. Yeah, for sure. No, that's awesome. Yeah. No, thanks for asking me to come on and talk shop. <laughs> awesome. All right. See you later, mate. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, Kelly. Cheers. Thanks.